the service of the Lord today. We welcome you to worship. In Psalm 113 it is written, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord be praised. Would you join us in singing together hymn number 12, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let us pray. We praise you, wondrous God, because your mercy has no end and the treasure of your bestowing goodness is infinite. Forgive us, though, of failures to live up to your loving and steadfast purposes. We have been obsessed with our own desires, which disregard and disrespect others. Hear us now as we come before you in a time of confession through private prayers and silence. As the only source of true pardon, restore us to a repaired and empowered life for faithfully serving among all of your people in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. Friends, let us hear and share with gladness the blessed news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us now hear the word of God, a reading from Exodus chapter 33, verses 14 through 23. Then God said to Moses, my presence will go with you and I shall give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from this place. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people upon the face of the earth. Then God said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, God, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim 
you the name of the Lord God. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord God continued, see, this is a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock. And while my glory passes, I will put you in a cliff on the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now a reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 34 through 36. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Genesaret. After the people of that place recognized the him, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even a fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the past 700 years, the Sunday following the celebration of Pentecost has been designated as Trinity Sunday. That would be since about 1320, give or take 10 years. This means that multiple centuries passed after the Holy Spirit blessed and inspired disciples of the crucified and resurrected Jesus in Jerusalem until later disciples of Jesus in the evolved church thought it would be positive to have a Sunday designated to celebrate God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or God as Sovereign Son and Spirit. Of course, God was not always known that way. For the first 300 years after Jesus, preaching, teaching, and writing occurred with multiple opinions from church leaders about who Jesus was in relation to God. Only in the 300s and the 400s did the emerging institutional church begin to take votes as to what the preferred answers were for the majority of those voting. Now that's how orthodoxy evolves. It's not the only right answer, so much as it is the best answer considered by a majority of those voting at a given time. And people, sadly, have persecuted one another and killed each other when disagreeing in the extreme about how God is God. Sometime between when I was 10 years old and received as a church member upon profession of faith in Jesus and the time when I was 25 years old and a senior student at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, I learned the simple rhyme, one in three and three in one, there you have the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Now, while that rhyme would have worked 
for an answer in my Gatesville, Texas, First Presbyterian Church membership and confirmation of faith class in the spring of 1963 at Austin Seminary between 1975 and 1979, it would have earned me a failing grade for being overly simplistic. Let me share with you, though, a story from 39 years ago. It's a story of two conversations a few months apart with the same person which have shaped my thinking ever since about how God is God. In 1981, I was two years beyond graduation from Austin Seminary, uh, two years beyond my ordination exams, and, and two years beyond my beginning work as an associate pastor in San Antonio when I was introduced to the Reverend Milton Bendiner. Milton was Emeritus Director of Religious Education at Temple Bethel, which was uh, and is the Reformed Jewish congregation in San Antonio's Midtown and San Pedro Park neighborhood. Milton's wife had died a few years before. He did not drive. Uh, he was frequently looking for a ride to a chamber music event or a religious studies lecture at Trinity University, etc. And, and after we met, uh, it was a time when I was not married, he, he sometimes would call and ask me for transportation. And when I could, I agreed to drive and accompany him. I was 27. He was uh, a little over 70, I think. In my opinion, he was easy to be with, but Milton was uh, cagey, and uh, he was engaging, and you just kind of had to watch how all that came together. Twice on our trips, he brought up the nature of God. Both times, we had just departed his house on East French Street, and we were headed west. And if you ask, how in the world can you remember that, it was just being with Milton or being with anyone like Milton. He had de dedicated his life to religious education. His uh, European extended family had died in the Holocaust. That was intimidating to me. Uh, it was intimidating to me, especially at the age of 27, when I felt uh, quite less skilled in faking what I didn't know than I might feel today. So as I was driving along that oak lined street the first time, we were headed to a religious studies lecture and from his passenger seat, Milton said, Theodore, you know Christians talk about a trinity even though Jesus quoted Deuteronomy about how God is one. And I knew that Milton was speaking about uh, the occasion in the Gospels, Mark chapter 12, I think, where Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And after he asked that, Milton was silent. I drove about a block, I guess, and I deduced that he was waiting for me to reply. Uh, you're exactly correct, Milton. I said, because he asked me to call him Milton and because I knew I needed to keep my reply simple. I didn't need to get off into the quicksand on this. I said, according to Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy, God is one. And he nodded affirmatively, saying nothing else on the subject. And neither did I. We went on to our event. Another time, just leaving Milton's house on our way to a chamber music concert, he said, Theodore, when Moses asked to see God's glory in chapter 33 of Exodus, God is said to have put a hand over Moses' eyes until God sufficiently passed. And when Moses finally got a glimpse, he only saw God's backside. Now, according to the scripture, he said, 
God was granting what God judged as essential in Moses' request. Granting not for Moses to behold glory, but to behold God's goodness on the backside, which includes graciousness and compassion. That's Exodus 33, verse 19. Would you agree? I said, I get that. At which point he asked, why then do you think some Christians act as if, uh, number one, God's glory is just another in a list of God's accessible qualities, and number two, as if God does not care crucially about becoming known through grace and compassion. I said, Milton, you make good points. Maybe some Christians want to snuggle in God's glory as if it was a child's favorite blanket and they haven't read Exodus 33 closely enough. He exhaled, sat back in his seat, and said, I think they may have not. According to my friend Milton, who died in 1996, and who today would be close to 110 years old, God is one, God's glory is too much for human eyes, and God's goodness includes graciousness and compassion. There is life-changing power in this trinity. God's goodness as God's graciousness and compassion. Matthew's Gospel account, chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, and chapter 14, verses 34 through 36, both tell of persons desiring to touch the hem of Jesus' shirt or Jesus' robe, just to touch the cloth or the fringe of the cloth that he was wearing. Why? Because, as the story is told, simply touching the hem of the cloth would change and heal a person's entire life. Moses, initially, did not know well enough what he was asking when he learned about God's character hundreds of years before Jesus. And yet, here is what Moses learned. Glimpse the goodness. Then the grace and the compassion of God in your midst will change, heal, and strengthen you. And through you, God will be at work to heal the pain and agony in others' lives, to support needed change, to give strength. And that is exactly what disciples of Jesus and those around him in the crowds understood, what Moses learned centuries before. If you are ever questioned whether you ask yourself inwardly or whether someone else asks you, about the Holy Trinity, about how God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and still is considered one God. You might recite the rhyme, one in three and three in one. There you have the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Or you might find it quite enough to say, with greater seriousness, greater truth, and greater accuracy, the three characteristics I sense in the centuries-old story of God with God's people, which God is said to value, are God's goodness demonstrated among people and creation with God's graciousness and God's compassion. That's what Moses learned and experienced that's what Jesus believed, taught, embodied, and shared with and through his life. That same graciousness and compassion from God's goodness, which Moses experienced and Jesus embodied and shared, are what the Holy Spirit coaxes forth from you and me and others in relation to a world in pain and agony. A world which has a positive yearning for healing. 
Sometimes it's not so much the garment or shirt you touch as someone passes by as it is the one who passes by touches you. God's goodness is graciousness and compassion. Isn't that the Holy Trinity we don't ever need to argue about? All honor and praise be to God. Friends, let us pray. With humble thankfulness, Holy Sovereign, we acknowledge your unspeakable love to us. We glorify you for your matchless goodness. Therefore, not trusting in our own worthiness or righteousness, but only in your grace, we offer once again to you the prayers from our deepest concerns. O oh, our strength and sure defense, Anoint with healing all who are afflicted, downcast, struggling, and despondent. Support the oppressed, deliver the tempted, sustain the ill and injured. Empower each one beyond tears of bereavement, and daily be to every person a holy shield and guide. Now again, we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As you go out into the world today and this week, go out in the name of goodness, graciousness, and compassion, and do all these things through our Father, through the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>